So we're gonna go ahead and move into organization and assignment of responsibilities. And if you turn to page 39 in the template, that's where we're gonna start. This is the other section in the template that really has the most work. Um, and where once we get into that post workshop guidance document, we're really gonna kind of focus on how do you build out this area? The first section of that concept of operations is really that story or that overview of this is how, um, if we are going to implement our care and shelter uh, capability, this is how you can expect to see it flow during an incident. But now we're gonna kind of dive down into who is actually responsible for doing what. And we identified a lot of different departments and positions throughout the concept of operations. So this is really gonna be more like a laundry list for each department, their overarching responsibilities. And then some of these departments obviously have some key roles and so those are also identified in the concept of operations. But we started on this pretty much alphabetically. Um, one of the things if you notice in this section is your jurisdiction may not have all of these departments or they may not have the functions and we'll talk about that some of them you will because they're basic to all jurisdictions but some of them you may not that doesn't mean that you don't have to address the responsibilities that are under that department the departments that you're seeing are really i kind of look at them as more kind of functional areas that are we kind of go through if you look at the powerpoint the way we approach the roles and responsibilities is obviously all has all incidents are owned locally um, so we start with you we start with the city what are your departments divisions positions what are they each responsible for and then we're going to move up to county then we're going to do a real brief statement on state and federal we're going to briefly talk about districts, authorities, and commissions, NGOs, what, what can they bring to the table, uh, what can they actually be looked at as far as support, and then we're going to briefly just wrap up this section with how the standard emergency management system works in the city, so your reader, as they get to the close of the roles and responsibilities, they know that you're an expert planner and you follow the state as far, as far as how you recognize this different levels of accountability and responsibility. So let's go ahead and start with the, we'll start with the city divisions. Let me just check something. Yeah, so we're gonna go ahead and start with city responsibilities. And like I said, for, let's take the first one for example because we aren't gonna have to go into depth in each of the bullet responsibilities for every single agency. Um, but what I want to do is show you how it's set up. A couple of them will run through and then you'll kind of get a feel for it. And then I'm going to tell you what you need to do with these different sections and how after you leave this workshop, you're going to finalize these sections out or these different uh, uh, categorized responsibilities. So let's start with aging. I would imagine how many cities have either a position or a department that deals with aging in their community. Yeah, most small departments don't, uh, small departments, most small jurisdictions don't, um, but there is most likely a point, a primary point of contact within your city organization that works with a lot of those organizations that support the elderly. And we're gonna talk about how you can go ahead and start to tap into these different organizations. But I'm gonna take aging right now as an example. So you don't have a department of aging. Is there any department that you might, and this is what you have to ask yourself when you get to each of these sections. Is there any department in your jurisdiction that might this category of dealing with issues related to elderly in a shelter might fall under? Or is it automatically gonna to revert to whatever department is responsible for shelter, care and shelter in your, okay. And so this is the challenge that you have is most of these bulleted responsibilities you're gonna to need to have in place. Um, they are very, uh, they're necessary responsibilities. They support certain services that you have to have in your care and shelter sites. So if you don't have a dedicated department for aging, that's when you need to look at, okay, well, what agency in my jurisdiction could fulfill that role? Uh, in our, one of the last workshops, they had a community development department. 
and the community development department worked with those agencies. So it may be a department you're not even aware of, and that's how the, the post-workshop uh, guidance work is gonna kind of flesh out, and we're gonna go more into it, but I just wanna kind of show you how this roles and responsibilities section could unfold for you. If you don't have another department that either they're already doing it, or they have the community contacts, or worst case scenario, they could be assigned that as a responsibility, then it's gonna revert back to your lead shelter, your department that's the lead for the shelter management, and those issues will need to be assigned to the shelter management staff to take care of. So one of the advantages that you have with people that are working with these organizations out there, and you can think of senior care centers, um, there are organizations for the elderly out there. Meals on Wheels is a very good example, um, but mostly the senior care centers, is that um, they have day-to-day -day relationships. Our aging department in the city actually works with and has close partnerships with the senior care centers so they can actually identify those places for possible shelter use and so that's a resource that we have at this in the city through that partnership and those relationships that have been built between our aging department and those private facilities that do senior care on an ongoing basis um, so those are some things to think about and then Worst case scenario, if we have a sheltering situation or we have an incident inside the city and these senior care centers have a, a portion of our population that are impacted, they're going there already, we actually have a communications loop also. So if you look at those ongoing partnerships. But if you just go through the responsibilities is you might have senior multi-purpose uh, centers other contracted agencies can come in. Uh, Meals on Wheels is a really good example. Let's say that you have to implement some kind of feeding operation and the vast uh, majority of the population, I think a good example, uh, it would be a fire through a senior care center or assisted living center and you have to evacuate that population. And let's say they had to go to a city shelter and you already had a Meals on Wheels a program, you could actually partner with Meals on Wheels to bring the food and provide the food service for them. Things like that. That's just an example of the type of mutual agreement that you could have in place. Mike, did you want to add anything? I see you're standing up. No, I was just, just to take one step further. This is a really good chance uh, to know, better know your merchant population in your community. I mentioned earlier knowing the city family or your jurisdiction's family, city manager, city attorney, the departments that you don't commonly interact with. Um, now would be a good time to reacquaint yourself with the Chamber of Commerce. Know what merchants are in your town, what services they have. You may delegate this to somebody, but if you're leading your city's or your jurisdiction's emergency management program, that's your resource base. Like your adjoining cities are, if you have a box store, in your community or grocery store chain, reach out and meet that lead person. Because on a bad day, they can be your lifeline. Exactly, and for a lot of you, and when you were doing your introductions, I know a lot of you have gotten this as a collateral assignment and you've never done this before. I will tell you, most likely the biggest challenge for you initially as you leave this workshop is going to be sitting down and listing out those stakeholders. Uh, because mo a lot of the stakeholders you're going to immediately recognize, but because you may have gaps um, that you you have areas of responsibility that you don't have a direct line within your city jurisdiction that you can automatically assign that to, you may have to go out there and, like Mike said, you may have to learn your community and what's out there. So parts of this is going to be really easy after the workshop guide after the workshop, but other parts may be a little take a little bit of work on. Okay, we don't have an aging department. Well, what organizations do I have out there? When we move up to the, we all know how we're organized in jurisdictions. We know how the counties organized in the state. At the federal level, they organize their whole response and recovery organization a little bit differently. They, they organize all of their departments under what are called emergency support functions. So if we were to talk about the mass care emergency support function, American Red Cross, they always assign a primary department and then they assign support departments. And that department, if they were deployed to assist at the local level, becomes that mass care functional support 
at the local level, okay? We know that we're organized a little bit differently. We organize under ICS, or maybe we might have used the California emergency functions. But just understanding that when we talk about emergency support functions, those are at that federal level, and that's how the federal level organizes their departments. Again, I'll let you know that mass care is a little bit unique because it's the only function where you have an outside agency that's not a federal department that's actually the lead. Almost all the other ESFs are all a federal department. For example, emergency support function for transportation is the Department of, Tra department of Transportation. Sorry about that. Department of Transportation, and um, then they have a number of support departments. So when we talk about the ESFs and she says they come in, that's what we're talking about. It's, it's that federal level response there. So we know, this isn't a class on ESFs, so you don't have to know that. There's no test on that. <laughs> so, but I don't want to keep referring to it and people are going, what's an ESF? So anyway, um, the thing is though, and when I talk about these bulleted areas, um, these are areas that are strongly recommended that they're still your responsibility as a jurisdiction. And if you look at them, they really go back to, and when we're talking about this particular function, whether it's aging, you're going to have elderly people in your shelters, and they're going to have unique needs specific to um, their, their population. And so as a local jurisdiction, whether you have an aging department or you don't, you're still going to be responsible for um, including inclusive planning for the elderly in your shelters. And so that's why um, a lot of these, most of these responsibilities, they fall under the city. If you don't have a specific person assigned now, you're going to have to look around and assign somebody, or you're going to start working with some outside organizations to fill that gap. But even if you have an or outside organization that comes in, you as a local jurisdiction are still responsible for that because you're there, your, your constituents. Okay. So um, sometimes, I don't know, you can look to this. There are departments at the county, and we're going to actually list those. There are departments in the county that do provide services at the local jurisdiction level, but I'm only going to list the ones for this plan that I know specifically. And you can talk with LA County OEM and some of these areas that you have a gap is sit down and, and schedule a meeting and ask them, are these areas that the county can supplement services for our shelter sites and find out if they can't provide that, then that's where you start to look at private vendors, faith-based, other non-governmental organizations, and there's a whole slew of them out there. Animal services, we know um, how many people have a dedicated department that handles animal services, or they've contracted with the county or other. Mm, okay. So definitely animal sheltering services. Definitely you're going to have service animals that are going to come into the shelters and service animals come with their owners um, and they are in your shelter, uh, your shelter sites. You will need to provide some basic animal services care. The owner is responsible for taking, bringing the, the supplies that they need for their animals, for their shelter, for their service animals. But we all know that if we were to talk about a fast moving wildfire, and we've seen it, we saw it in the Paradise Fire, we've seen local fires where the, the residents barely have time to get in their cars, you're gonna have some clients that are gonna come in and they may have their, their, their service animals with them and they don't have any supplies. So that's why we're responsible for kind of shoring up that gap and making sure we at least have some way to do it. Now, a good way to support this is there's a lot of um, rescue organizations out there that, especially for like large uh, animals, um, there's a lot of equine groups that are definitely volunteer to come in and provide that support on animal services with the caveat that you are still responsible for providing those, those human and animal service needs but they come in to support you and, and really can provide those services. But those are the organizations, and we're gonna talk about memorandums of understandings. Those are additional organizations you'll have to establish an MOU with. Okay. And you have a lot of local, and I've heard of this happening over and over again, you have a lot of local vets that actually do overnight kenneling anyway, and a lot of times they'll step up and they'll support you. But Again, the whole provision of animal sheltering is the responsibility of a local jurisdiction, especially under the Katrina 
uh, the pet, I can never say the whole thing, but the uh, uh, post-Katrina Act. And so looking at those bulleted responsibilities that I have there, that may fall back under a, a department or a division or a position in your city. The one thing, uh, no matter if you are going to have an outside agency supporting you with some of these areas, they still have to be connected to your EOC or you're, you're, you're gonna be doing that most likely through your shelter manager, but they have to be connected to your EOC or your field command. Whoever has the ultimate accountability and responsibility, the operational responsibility, which we talked about under concept of operations, you have got to make sure that those agencies have a way to stay connected to you, that they're sharing information with you and you're sharing information with them. A lot of times the most effective way to do that is to actually see if they can provide an agency representative and you can embed them in your EOC organization or in the field and then that way you have that conduit of information sharing already established. If you don't have that, then you're gonna to have to establish some way that you can keep in touch with them because technically they're a part of your response and so if they're providing that service for you. In other words, you can't just say, okay, go forth and do good and then just leave them and uh, let them go on their own. So um, just, a, just a caveat on that. So take a look at those bullets. Um, one of the things under aging if you notice, uh, I think it's the third bullet down, um, it says something about emergency meals are currently in place in various parts of the city to distribute. If you don't have that, delete that. Okay, our jurisdiction had that capability. So you just wanna delete that. And so that's what you're gonna have to do, just like you did in the concept of operations, is read through each of those bullets. Um, if you don't have it, and it's something that you can drop off of the list, that's great. But if you don't have it, most of these you should have in place. Well, highly recommended. Um, I know disability is a tough one because that is such a complex arena in every single aspect of our emergency response and recovery. And that includes our care and shelter operations. And one of the things in your cities, I am going to guess because it's been such a contentious litigation area, is you have somebody in your city that's probably been assigned as a collateral duty or a direct assignment the whole ADA compliance area. I, it may be somebody that you aren't even aware of. A lot of times it's out of the city manager's or the mayor's office because again it's been a, a real political, um, it's been kind of used as a big political issue over the last five years with a lot of litigation. But this whole area of disability is something that you've been provided, bless you, We've, you've been provided that inclusive, that strategy for inclusive planning that came out of the county. That's probably gonna give you really good guidance, but that's gonna be something when you come out of this workshop, you're gonna do, kinda need to ask some questions about does our city have somebody that monitor, cause you have day-to-day -day ADA compliance going on all the time, don't you? A good example is sidewalks. There is somebody going around checking your city for like ramps on your buildings or the ramps going up at the intersections of streets. So somebody in your jurisdiction has the responsibility to be that ADA conduit. And whether they know it or not, they may be falling into this area during emergencies because they're the most knowledgeable and they're already up to speed on ADA compliance. And they're most likely your best technical expert. Those of you who are in incident command, you understand technical expert. Um, they're, they're, most, you're, they're your most likely resource to at least pull in and say, okay, what do we need to do for accessibility here? What do we need to consider? But the good news is a lot of the accessibility issues I've actually written into the language. And so if you start with those as a core, it's a good start. But you, that ADA person in your city should become your disability representative for at least advisory on sheltering operations. And not only that, they should be sitting at your table when you do these planning meetings that we're gonna talk about afterwards. So that's really a critical area. And if you notice, it, there's a number of bullets under that section. Okay, so moving to page, let me go down, because it's a little bit different. So let's go to emergency management, and that's on page 40. So emergency management, it's listed as a department, but a lot of jurisdictions, it may be one person or I'm kind of guessing that it may actually be you. <laughs> uh, 
So depending on it, you may not have an emergency de uh, management department. For example, there was some fire representatives in here that they've been assigned collateral duties for emergency management. That happens a lot. Either fire or police get the responsibility or somebody that's in a, a finance and admin office gets that collateral duty to be, oh, guess what? You're also the emergency manager or you may have a dedicated emergency management. So this whole emergency management area uh, really encompasses a lot of responsibilities. A lot of times it, um, it starts with the preparedness activities that you're doing right now. It's the drafting of that care and shelter plan. Uh, that person may actually be the lead for the planning as it moves forward, or forward as you start to do some planning meetings with your stakeholders. Your emergency manager may actually, and this happened in our last workshop, they're actually the lead for the shelter. They be, they're shelter managers. So they're actually the one that goes out to the shelters and they're that uh, shelter manager for shelter sites. So your emergency management department has a number of different roles and responsibilities, but it's very dependent on your jurisdiction. So take a look at that. A lot of those um, are kind of straightforward. Coordinates the city's emergency planning, um, activation of the, account, of the EOC. Um, uh, they might actually facilitate the local proclamation process. But again, if you don't have an emergency management department, take a look at those bullets and you're gonna have to connect them to who does do that because most of these bullets under emergency management are standard program responsibilities for your jurisdiction, unlike some of these others that may fall to outside jurisdictions. Fire department, pretty self-explanatory. Um, you're gonna have to, and a lot of this is gonna be done in stakeholder meetings, which I'm gonna go into in the post-workshop guidance. But your fire department, um, they definitely need a seat at your planning table, just like your police department. Because what they need to do is they need to read these responsibilities and make sure that this is something that they can apply. Sometimes a fire department will say yes, depending on the scope and scale of the incident and depending on available resources, we may provide an EMS person for your, the shelter site. So they may provide you know, an EMS person just to do standby to have some basic medical, but they may not be able to, and that's up to your jurisdiction. But you can see those are the general, um, those are the general responsibilities. But one thing they are responsible for is the fire life safety for the facility. And so they may need to do a fire life safety inspection on that facility, and that's just to make sure that you know the, the, the fire alarms are working, the fire extinguishers, et cetera. And I'm not gonna go into that because I'm not a fire inspector, but there are actually fire life safety requirements for, and you guys can speak to that better than I can, but the facilities will need, you guys inspect your facilities for the fire life safety? Yeah, so even if you've done a site evaluation and inspection for the sheltering side, that facility still needs that life safety inspection by the fire department. And that can be done on a, beforehand as a preparedness activity. Um, certain circumstances due to immediate life safety threats, they may be the initial requester to open up a site. And we talked about that. If they're in field command and there is an immediate need to place people in a safe location, they may make a decision to activate. And so they may be that initial, and then they may, they definitely provide that 911 emergency medical response because that's part of their normal jurisdictional responsibilities. So um, is there anything you guys can think of you can add to that? We haven't actually had the benefit, last time we had a few fire, but is there anything you guys can think about for care and shelter generic that should be added to that? I think we pretty much covered it. Yeah, because fire, you know, fire has a, a load of responsibilities for other areas, the response, so their participation in shelters is usually somewhat restrictive, so, but those are some core. Um, general services, I don't know if you have a general services, but it's your department that gets stuff. I'm sure you all, somebody, you have a department that goes out, they're responsible for establishing vendor contracts. Um, they actually are the ones that manage a lot of the procurement of normal day-to-day -day supplies. Uh, this is your best department to actually use in your logistics section, but they're actually gonna have some responsibilities for supporting your care and shelter sites because there may be supply needs or resource needs that come up out of the blue that you're gonna have to quickly get a, hand, get a hold of them and you may have to do some emergency procurement. Usually your whatever department you have that's the getter of stuff, 
Um, they actually have the ability to make emergency purchases. Um, they usually have the authority to do that. They have all the processes for contracting in place. And they're usually connected to those authorities in your city that can actually authorize emergency spending. So, and you can see the bullets under that. So, general services and then, okay, so on, on the next page, which I think is 41, we're going to move into some other pretty straightforward ones um, that you most likely don't have. A lot of you, I'm sure, don't have a housing department. Um, the reason it's in here is because sometimes as you transition to, to that long-term housing solution, having a housing representative or somebody that handles housing issues in your jurisdiction, when you put them at the table when you're planning this care and shelter annex, they can start to anticipate how it's going to effectively and smoothly transition into recovery. So they're more of a stakeholder that really needs to know how you're envisioning this, this short-term sheltering to go, and you bring them to the table and they can participate. Uh, because maybe you might be actually closing shelters fairly quickly and moving to some short-term housing solutions. Think, for example, hotels, things like that. And even though American Red Cross manages a lot of this on their own, sometimes cities do step in and also implement these short-term housing solutions with hotels, vouchers, and things like that. It just depends on, on the incident and what the decisions are made. Your personnel, I talked to you a little bit, that's your human resources, whatever department or division really handles a lot of your regular employee files, handles a lot of your, you know, the, the areas that are already considered privacy areas. And personnel are really great for registration. They're used to a lot of that documentation. So looking at some responsibilities that you can assign to your personnel department, we've put those. And you can see provides information or activates the jurisdiction's disaster service worker. Um, they might be able to provide childcare staff. Um, sometimes a lot of, it depends on how big your jurisdiction is, some jurisdictions have a child care um, operation embedded in their jurisdiction for their employees. A lot of times it's managed out of the personnel and human resources department because it's an employee benefit or employee support. This is a really good way to coordinate, personnel is a good one to coordinate that child care. Um, there are organizations out there though, and this is when, if you can't fill it in the city, you'd go to an outside agency. There are organizations out there that will manage the, uh, the child aspect of your shelter. There's a lot of great ones. There's Children in Disasters. Disaster right, and then there's Save the Children, and they are all available, and you can contact them, and they'll come in and go over and meet with you and tell you what services they provide. Um, this one in the Disaster Service Worker Program, how many people have a official Disaster Service Worker Program implemented in their city? Okay. If you don't have that in place, a very strong recommendation that you make the official move to embed the Disaster Service Worker Program in your jurisdiction, it is actually a state program. And we all fall under that program. It's going to be a shock to your employees when something happens and that statewide Disaster Service Worker Program is implemented and your employees find out that they fall under that. And so uh, we didn't have it in place, so I can tell you short term, we then, we had to go back because there's an oath that you sign upon your employment. And all public uh, service employees are supposed to have signed that oath when they come on board as an employee. But obviously, like everything that we do, not everybody knows that this is supposed to be done. So a lot of jurisdictions don't have that program in place. They sign an oath. Each department is responsible for their own disaster service worker group. And most of the time, it's just it's your employee roster. But what we're supposed to kind of be doing is actually developing spreadsheets of certain skills, basic skills that employees have. You know, uh, are, can they feed? Do they have basic uh, Red Cross, uh, you know, Red Cross medical training? Um, are, what other skills do they have? Are, you know, do we have any engineers that might be able to out, go out and do site evaluations? So there's a lot of preparedness in advance on the Disaster Service Worker Program. But the thing with the Disaster Service Worker Program is during times of emergency when it's activated, those people are, are the people that are, that are not assigned specific direct responsibilities and don't have key functions in the city 
can support us by other assigned tasks as long as they've been long as they can get some training and it's not unsafe for them to perform it so when you look at shelters there's a lot of tasks in shelters that a lot of our city departments can do if we have a 7.8 earthquake i can guarantee you that all your finance departments aren't going to be doing a lot at that time and so and I, I don't mean that a derogatory it's just that the last thing we're going to do when life safety is a priority is be sitting there worrying about whether we're collecting property tax or things like that so for example during the 1994 northridge earthquake uh, the city of los angeles has a division that goes out and collects you know taxes from the residents during that time those employees that were assigned the valley the city said, we're not going to go out, we're not going to ask people for taxes when they've just had severe damage to their home. So all those employees were assigned to go to points of distribution throughout the valley and provide food and water to the residents. And actually, when I talked to those people that were assigned that, they said it was the best time they ever had working in the city because it was a lot more, they got a lot more fulfillment out of doing that than their day to day. But these are just an example. You have to think of that disaster service worker firm. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, go on the state website, find out about the program, go to some other jurisdictions that have it in place, get their oath document, their template, but you should be getting that in place because we're all required to have it. And knowing and actually having the advantage of doing this pre-planning for your disaster service worker program, you can identify those divisions or departments that you can do some preparedness training ahead of time and get them some basic shelter training. Well, we're gonna talk about that at the end of the template, but that's where you know implementing that program actually gives you another viable resource. And like you said, to quote, what was the section again? I'm, I'm always impressed with that. <laughs> I can quote it. Yeah, section 836452, code 12467544, section 126. <laughs> but anyway, you can go ahead and pull that up. But yes, it is a requirement. So I think it's under the Emergency Services Act, I think. Yeah. Um, so police department, pretty straightforward. But again, you, and we're going to talk about how do you confirm? How do you confirm that these agencies, organizations know that this is their responsibility? Or how do you provide them a chance to give input? Um, recreation and parks, uh, this is normally, uh, most jurisdictions, this is usually the lead department uh, for uh, care and shelter because of the fact that they operate a lot of the public recreation centers and we all know that centers are a great place to establish shelters because there's a lot of things already in place there's bathrooms sometimes there's showers and it's a nice big open space um, and so that's one of the things is to look at your department but your jurisdiction may be a different department it may not be a recreation and parks but you will have and you notice they have that lead responsibility uh, for once you make the decision to activate the shelter, um, either th under field command or at the EOC, that's gonna be that lead department that's gonna have the oversight from that point forward to go ahead and manage that whole care and shelter functions, okay? So that's it for the city. Now what you would wanna do here is if you have any other departments um, that were not covered here, any other divisions or any other responsibilities that you assign related to care and shelter, you would just add these in the section. But I honestly think that you're gonna find that most of those bullets, they're pretty inclusive. So even if I don't have them identified to the right department, if you find who can do them in the city, you're gonna cover most of your responsibilities at the city level, okay? So we're gonna move now to page 42. And we're briefly, I'm not going to go too much in depth. Uh, I may have, like, John speak up. Um, I think, did Ashu step out? Yeah, I'll, I'll have John speak a little bit when we get to that point. But all of the county department responsibilities, oh, perfect timing, Ashu. Yeah, for the next, for the next hour, you need to speak on county responsibility. I know, I'm just joking. Go ahead. <laughs> so... <laughs> We're all among friends here. Little humor. It's after lunch. I got to keep everybody awake because we've all eaten. But anyway, on um, the county, all of those responsibilities were vetted by the county. They've been confirmed by the county. So you aren't really going to need to put a, make a lot of different changes. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give John and Ashu. We've actually provided throughout the document, we've provided a number of different numbers. We actually, if you read throughout the document, you'll find LA County Office of Emergency Management has a 24 seven duty officer. And we've provided that number there for you. American Red Cross has their 24 seven. 
we've provided that number, and then I think the DCFS, DCFS, we had a number, and do we provide the number for DPSS? All these acronyms. Did we provide a number for you guys, or no, it's just DCFS, isn't it? DCFS. Yeah, great. So, but I'm gonna let, um, I'm gonna go ahead and, John, you wanna take the Children and Family Services? So, if there's unaccompanied minors at the shelters, and there's no law enforcement, you know, on site, you can contact. Typically, it's probably best uh, if it's a Red Cross run shelter. It's seamless. Uh, Red Cross already knows how to go directly to DCFS. If it's a city run shelter, uh, not just for in terms of requesting DCFS for public health nurses, all that, it may be a challenge because you guys typically don't do that. Uh, hopefully, like I say it's uh, a partnered with Red Cross because they know who to go to. But let's say if the city opens up a shelter, Red Cross is not available because of a catastrophic event, you guys would go to the County Emergency Operations Center to request public health nurses, mental health counselors, uh, whatever is required. Uh, but once again, it's just depending on if it's a city run or a Red Cross. And in terms of what else, in terms of DCFS, uh, so they would deploy someone there to be with the child until a relative or someone, an adult, relative can come on site. Um, and I can kind of transition real quick to DPSS. Page 44. Yeah, I was going to say, just go ahead and cover both of them. So then our department, we have about 800 employees who have been trained to work in shelters. Um, and there's an additional 250 other county employees that have been trained. Once again, if it's Red Cross run, Red Cross knows to go to DPSS to request staff if necessary. Uh, in your situation, if it's just a city run, then you would just go to the County Emergency Operations Center to request uh, staffing support. And, and so that's that's something new. We gotta see our staff have been trained to work in a Red Cross shelter. Now, if it's a city run shelter, we're hoping that you guys run it like the Red Cross does, because our staff have been trained to actually support Red Cross. And, and then they have their own thing where everybody's welcome, you know, whether they're undocumented or whatever, everyone is welcome into the shelter. And that's a culture that I think we all need to embrace, the county and cities, to, to really duplicate the Red Cross model, where everyone feels welcome and, and they will come to the shelter. But now, in this day and age, they may, you know, undocumented may think there's ICE associated with the shelter, uh, if it's a city or county run. So that's a really, we gotta be that neutral, uh, everyone's welcome in, in the sites. And in terms of DPSS, so there's a component in terms of like we support shelter operations by staff and whatever else is needed. But a big part is recovery. Um, we have, like I said, our social service programs. There are some programs that we can, for this is transition from this a shelter to you know an actual uh, long-term location. Uh, we, we can provide, depending on income, uh, first and last month's rent, uh, Medi-Cal, cash assistance. And so we kind of transition from temporary shelter and we can maybe ma maintain those individuals in, into a, a permanent shelter. Any questions for DPSS? Or for anything in terms of DCFS? And once again, public health, mental health, all those other county departments, uh, those requests typically would go to the county emergency center to, to send out to your location. Good, good. Are you, you, you just want to wrap that up on all the county departments then? Well, all that it, as you kind of close Yeah, it, it, in terms of the, the traditional departments that actually support shelters. Right. So one of the things he noted is, and uh, you know, make a note of that, is all of these county departments are definitely our resources, but you still need to go through that request process uh, to go ahead and request those resources. It's just like any other uh, mutual aid request. Ashu, I'm not meaning to put you on the spot, but do you want to add something in here? Because um, like, like I, we definitely have your office uh, noted, so anything you want to add that might be useful? I'm just going to reiterate kind of what I said earlier. Our office is primarily responsible for coordination and communication. So um, a lot of times, what from my experience, what happens is uh, you get uh, individuals and agencies get stuck because some request comes in that's outside of their norm, and they don't know where to go to. I just want to reiterate that you know if you if you're going, you can go directly to your emergency management staff at your uh, at your city. But if they're not around or if they're busy, come to the county. Like we have that, I mean, lack of better words, we have the Rolodex and we know what other resources and what other tools we can provide for you. We might not be able to solve your problem, but we'll know who to go to, who will be the best person to help address your concerns or your needs. So that's really, I mean, reiterating that. Um, the resource request process, 
Uh, I know it's, it's, it's formal and it's mainly for reimbursement and making sure you're tracking costs and everything else. Uh, but the main thing is if you can't do it in the formal, like through orders or whatever else, even if you call us and let us know, that still starts the process. We'll document it and send it back to you and say, hey, is this what you wanted? And that'll be the documentation. You know, so don't let that be the barrier because, oh, I can't contact the county because I can't get into orders or my, I don't have the email address. You have the number, make the call. Right, so that's take always message. life safety. Yeah. If there's an immediate need, yeah, it's yeah. always life safety. So and again, hopefully, you know, anything in this plan is not, you know, it isn't like a hard wall. We have to be flexible, and we have to, we have to flex with the needs and the priorities that exist in front of us. You know, one of the things, and I'm not meaning to, you know, really stretch OEM really thin because they're like all of us; they have a limited staff. But my recommendation is you can either do it collectively as four or five cities, but schedule a meeting with them and just come and talk to them a little bit and say, hey, you know, what does your services look like? I mean, you, you don't have to develop an MOU with the county. So they are actually, that is their responsibility to provide services countywide. But it's always a good idea to know what to expect, isn't it? I mean, when we all show up to know what we know, what we're really sure of that you're going to provide, and then being sure of what you aren't going to provide is just as useful. Because if I know you're not going to provide it, and I had an expectation that you were, then I'm going to have to go someplace else to fill that gap. If you don't have that collective discussion, you're going to run in with a lot of expectations at the time the incident happens, and something's going to fall through the cracks. So go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I'm just dealing with right now an, uh, an example, and it's a, it's a sheltering issue. Right now, we had a board and care facility um, that actually had uh, a fire, and we had to transport uh, those individuals into a shelter. So the shelter. We are not only coordinating with public health, mental health, um, uh, DPSS to make sure to see what services uh, are were they already receiving or what services they can get, but we're also working with Red Cross to make sure that the shelter has uh, the uh, affiliated uh, supplies and services to address these clients. And if they don't, who else can help bridge that gap? We're also working with the owner of that facility to provide more sustained long-term housing. So these are all things to consider. It's, if it's not being done at, at the local level, you know, we'll help support it. We're working with the city, it's LA City where this is at, and working with them making sure everybody's on the same page. I mean, I just was, when I was out of the room, I was just on the call with two different entities because one had one set of information and another one had another. And our job is to make sure everybody's on the same page. So we, would, we could even arrange and coordinate conference calls. You know, if it's everybody's remote, to have that discussion to make sure everybody's on the same page. So that's just an example of the services um, and, and some of the stuff that we would be doing. Right. We're, we're one big happy family in the county. So, sure. Yeah. How big is your staff and where are you located? So our, we're in uh, East LA, right off of, uh, of Eastern and uh, the 10 freeway. Uh, our staff has grown um, recently, so we have about 20 uh, emergency managers um, with a variety of levels of experience but basically all of them they all have the Rolodex so if, if they can't if you have a newer staff member that can't address the thing they'll reach out to uh, our cadre and and be able to provide that support so um, yeah we're pretty robust and also it's it's all relationships you know like uh, we know who to contact from each department that would be involved with it we have relationships with Red Cross and with most of the jurisdictions, I mean, half the people in this room I've, I've worked with and interacted with at one time or another. So that's the main thing. So, so. so I'm just going to briefly, very quickly identify some of the other um, or, uh, agencies with the county. You've got the emergency medical services. They actually oversee the whole medical system throughout the county. You can see the bullets there. Um, health services, um, and then mental health is, I will tell you that the county mental health, Department of Mental Health, is a really a real critical resource. Um, like, for example, the city of Los Angeles, we don't have a health department, and we didn't have a mental health department. So um, mental, Department of Mental Health at the county level was always supporting us, not only at our uh, shelter locations, but a lot of times when we activated a local as uh, assistance center, um, Department of Mental Health would provide staff so those people coming in that had been impacted by the tragedy and were really dealing with a lot of stress, a lot of mental issues, could actually go to a spot inside of the facility, quiet spot behind closed doors, 
and really start to talk to the LA County uh, mental health folks. So th it's really a good idea. Some of these departments that I'm listing off for you are some key ones. Department of Public Health, Public health officer is the lead for any public health related and they will definitely, they have the authority to come in and inspect your shelters. Uh, they're the ones that can actually review your food preparation. And so they are definitely a support agency, not necessarily one you're gonna be assigning, you know, they don't have direct responsibilities, but they do have that responsibility for public health across the county. And so your shelter lies under their jurisdictional authority. So, um, not to put anybody on the spot, does anybody want to add anything for public health regarding shelters? Okay, so you can read through those bullets, but that's basically it for the county. And again, all those bullets were directly, they were obtained from these county departments. So you shouldn't really have to change anything at all, unless something when your meetings in the discussion with Office of Emergency Management they say, oh, we also have this responsibility and it's not on your list, then you would just add it if, you're, if you do a meeting. Okay. So this is how we dealt with the state and the federal level because they're just like um, the county, there are numerous departments at the state and the federal level that provide support depending on the scope and scale of the incident. But the thing is, is we cannot direct any of those agencies. We have no authority over them, but under NIMS and SEMS, we know that they are part of our mutual aid network. So what we basically did in the language, if you notice, is we've just really done a very short overview statement on the state, saying that although the city has no jurisdiction over the state, it is recognized that under the state emergency plan, under the Emergency Services Act, that the state does provide through its departments um, mutual aid down to local jurisdictions as needed when ordered through the county. All mutual aid that we request at the state level is done through the county. And like, like Ashu said, it's either gonna be, you're gonna do through it the formal systems or if worst case scenario, you're gonna pick up the phone and let the county know. And, um, and they're gonna look at their resources if, they're if they don't have enough resources to support you, then they're gonna reach up to the state and contact the state operations center. And the state's gonna look at those departments that have those responsibilities. The state of California has what's called emergency functions, which are very similar to the emergency support functions. And it's very interesting, because here in California, we always have to do things a little different but they reflect very much the federal emergency support functions. It's the same concept. There's a lead state department with supporting departments and they're assigned that, that function. And you can go online and look them up and I think the state has two more. The feds have 15 and the state has two more or three more. So what we end up doing here is, as I told you before, um, Let's go up here to, we're gonna to go to the next one is district authorities and commissions. And you may not have anything like this, but there are some like special districts. A lot of times your water authorities are a special district. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Michael may have talked to you a little bit about this, but this is the planning section of this, uh, of this workshop. And in your plans, we, Red Cross can not only help you train people and train your managers, but we also um, can help you identify your facilities. A lot of you have buildings that have been identified as shelter um, sites, but either you don't have a formal agreement, an MOU, or if the assessment was done years ago and it's kind of changed hands and uses, we're willing to come back in and reassess your shelter site, make sure it does meet all the ADA requirements, and it also is the best facility to have in your area. Um, if there are new sites that have been uh, built in the interim, we usually reassess about every three years, but we're behind. And it's a big push this year to go ahead and work with the cities to come up with additional shelter sites. So I am not going to be the key person you would be talking to. She's, um, we have three shelters that we've opened in three days. So she is Andrea. She's going to be learning how to do all those things today as a new employee. But she's going to be your point of contact. So if you have a city that you would like either additional training or you would like to have um, sites looked at, and with the idea that we'll end up with some MOUs, 
just give me your business card and I'll pass it on to her and she can get back to you um, pretty quickly. We're moving on this pretty quickly. Okay, cool. So going into the district's authorities and commissions is most likely you may only have one agency that falls under this and um, I don't know what your school agency is and for example in the city of Los Angeles our school agency was Los Angeles Unified School District and so there might be times when a school facility might be used and we're going to talk about the schools a little bit more on restrictions and considerations but one of the things is they are a potential resource for sites. Uh, there are challenges with using schools. The one, one that can come to mind the most is this is a school. So if you're using it for a shelter and the children need to return to school, you've tied up a school facility um, for use as a shelter site, and that does have some impacts. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later on. But a lot of times the schools, because a lot of them are so old, don't meet accessibility. And the other problem is, is that if you look at a lot of the resources at schools, they stand about that high. <laughs> so your chairs, your, it, it's just not a very conducive place. They don't usually have, you know, it's some, a lot of them, they aren't gonna have showers. So we really look at schools as like a last resort, but what schools are really good for is if you have, you know, families with children and that's their school, is to shelter in the school and then you have some familiarity uh, with the location but they can be used but when you do and we're going to talk about this under memorandums of agreement of understanding is you need to sit down with that school and you need to discuss what that means um, if the school is going to activate a site as a shelter uh, there's actually school police that are on site and that school police will provide and coordinate security along with whoever your police department is so that's an additional responsibility that they can take on because they have the staffing. And then uh, not only that is um, you want to go ahead and if you can try to, if they're gonna be providing schools or if you're gonna be working with them to have schools as shelter facilities, it's really a good recommendation to embed them somewhere in your EOC or your field command, just to make sure that you include them in that information sharing. So non-governmental organizations and additional support, uh, obviously we've been talking about Red Cross throughout all this workshop today. Um, they, are, they are a key non-governmental organization, but there are other NGOs out there, and that's where you're gonna take a look at your community. There are other um, organizations that operate under this non-governmental organization umbrella, um, but American Red Cross is our key partner. Again, you see where that memorandum of understanding is really emphasized. And so if you don't have that MOU, you're gonna to need to delete that language. And actually American Red Cross provided this, so there isn't a lot for you to change. Uh, so that one's pretty self-explanatory. Emergency Network of Los Angeles and volunteer organizations active in disaster, your ENLA and your VOADs, they exist everywhere. And they are a great resource for additional personnel uh, resources to help in shelters. A lot of times these organizations have already worked in shelters with American Red Cross. A lot of the organizations are very familiar with the American Red Cross process. So getting to know who your local representative or even as a county representative is really helpful because they do have resources to help you out. We close out this section really to talk about and again to really kind of demonstrate to whoever's reading this plan is yes, this plan, we recognize the state emergency management sy system and our levels, you've got all those levels there, you've got local, you know, county, state, federal, and then how those are layered, and then obviously we all sit under SEM. So it's just a nice, it's a nice closing statement about that whole uh, section on roles and responsibilities. So before I go into admin and finance on page 47, is there any questions on roles and responsibilities? And we're actually gonna talk about how you're gonna bring this section into really solid being in the post-workshop guidance. But those are really the bulleted response, roles and responsibilities that are pretty general and generic to a care and shelter operation. So, yeah. Eight hours, 12 hours? Um, our shelter operations, uh, well, our, when the city of LA goes, it's really dependent on your jurisdiction. 
Uh, you'll have to ask American Red Cross what theirs are, but ours are 12 hours. So we normally have a eight to nine hour day. Uh, whenever we go into an emergency, our EOC, um, not our fire, our fire goes to, is already on a 24. Um, our police are on a 10, but everybody else goes to a 12. And so we do, you know, six to six, six to six. But our shelters are managed by ARC. So whatever ARC de determines, and I think Michael stepped out. Or Michael, you're back there. Okay, there you are. Uh, what are the standard operational periods for the shelter? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> it's 12 hour operation. There you go. Thank and you. we would love it to be eight hour, but we have got the manpower to do three shifts. So yeah. it's always 12, if you're lucky. We're all in that boat. Yeah, so everybody goes to that 12 hour and that. Are you guys six to six though? Uh, usually it's six to six, but there's some flexibility. In yeah. That first operational period, you may be working a little bit longer to sync up, but we're, we're on ICS operational period like you guys are. We go to that six to six. Um, yeah. For animal control, we contract with a nonprofit. So, would it be appropriate to list them on the beginning of Section 3 or have them under the non governmental? If it's a nonprofit, um, you mean list them under your city? Yeah, we would list them under a city function or we list them under the non governmental under the Red Cross? You would list them under the non governmental because they're not under your city authority. You've contracted with them, so. You're, they're basically somebody that you're working with, but they're not a they're not a city authority, so you'd put them under the NGO. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Very good question. So that's where some of those uh, responsibilities that I that was a very good example of what I was talking about. Some of those responsibilities that may not be an internal city agency that's responsible for it. If it's an outside agency, you have to take that responsibility out of the city and you have to identify it to whether it's a county or a district commission or an NGO, but here's the challenge. Except for county, anybody that falls into those other areas, you should be sitting down and drafting out a memorandum of understanding with them as what that means when we say that you're going to be part of our shelter, care and shelter organization. Because technically, even though you contract with them, and here's, here's a lesson learned. When we came out of the litigation, uh, a lot of our contracts read that a vendor is gonna provide us services. Let's say, for example, a busing contract. So a lot of our buses are private vendor contracts for the city of LA. Well, it turns out there's nothing in the contract language that states that those bus drivers will drive buses during emergencies. So there was nothing in the contract. They're there eight to five and at five o'clock that contract reads, they clock out and that's it. So what our Department of Transportation did is they went back and took all those contracts. When they came up for renewal, they wrote in language that says during times of emergency, you will provide. Now, this is a challenge because the first thing you're thinking is, is, well, the vendor's not gonna agree to it. Yes, they do agree to it because they want the money. And um, you're gonna, you know, and that's that competition. But you can actually start to draft your contracts to address emergency situations. So your vendors are very clear. They have the option, yeah, we can provide those emergency services or no, we can't. And then you may have, to, at least you've identified a gap and then you may need to go out and do an additional contract for an emergency situation. But just having no language in your contract and expecting that they'll be there that doesn't happen. They're not obligated to, to do it, even though you contracted for those services because it wasn't written in the contract language. So that's something to think about. 